you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen, Lord, have mercy. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us draw with confidence near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are not truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins throughout the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, a Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall appoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on an outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shana pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, 
And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with Psalm 23. Let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul, and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed to the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As he walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. 
and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, this is hands down one of the strangest things I have ever done. Over the course of nearly 20 years of ordained ministry, I've stood hundreds of times in front of a congregation to preach. But this is the first time I've preached on a Sunday looking out at empty pews. It's a powerful and painful reminder of the ways that the coronavirus has changed our lives. It's hard to believe how quickly all of this has happened. Within just the past week or so, we've gone from taking precautions with small gatherings to social distancing that amounts to virtual self-quarantine. The spread of the coronavirus has stripped us down to the bare essentials forcing us to give up so much that we take for granted in our daily lives and routines. As one observer notes, coronavirus may not have infected every person, but it has infected all of us as a people. It's okay to acknowledge and express how we're feeling as this pandemic unfolds. We're anxious, scared, Angry, disappointed, sad, frustrated, and at times bewildered. Some have loved ones who are sick and in the hospital. Others may lose loved ones and not even be able to be with them in their final moments. Some among us are doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals on the front lines in hospitals and clinics. Thank you for your service and your sacrifices. And then there is the economic fallout that will surely affect all of us one way or another. We may be working from home, as our teachers at St. Luke's and around the country in schools, colleges, and universities ramp up online and distance learning. We may have been laid off or had to let workers go. We may have had to give up a job to stay home to care for children now that they're out of school and daycare centers. Our business may be struggling to operate. We don't know what the future holds. There's also the odd phenomenon of prospective grieving. The grieving of things that were supposed to happen in the future but now have been canceled. That includes for the foreseeable future the upcoming calendar of worship services and church activities, including very likely Holy Week and Easter. Recording and even live streaming worship, it just isn't the same as gathering in person. I feel particularly heartbroken for young persons, especially seniors in high schools and in colleges and universities whose culminating sports, academic, and social activities and achievements have all gone away. It's possible that many won't even get to have a graduation ceremony. College students find themselves living back at home away from the close communities they have developed. Internships and study abroad programs are canceled indefinitely. And for the youngest among us, it's hard not to be able to see our friends for birthday parties or our grandparents for that special hug. It's devastating. We've never experienced anything like this before. This is new territory, and we don't have a map or a compass to help us make our way. But as Christians, 
as persons who in our baptisms belong in life and in death to a crucified and risen Lord, we have grounds for hope and confidence that not even pestilence and plague can take away from us. And that's why we Christians are at our best when the times are worst. That's been true throughout history. It will no doubt continue to be true today. And it all goes back to Jesus, who lived through all of this. I don't mean that Jesus lived through a pandemic like the coronavirus, but Jesus did live in a time of daily, if not hourly, uncertainty and even crisis. For back in Jesus' day, oppression of the weak by the strong, pervasive poverty, hunger and starvation, diseases without cure, that was the norm. In spite of it all, Jesus lived as the light of the world. He modeled the love and compassion that caught people's attention. And just as we heard in today's Gospel reading, in which he healed a man blind from birth, Jesus performed the works of God in ways that bore witness to the awe-inspiring, hope-filled truth that a new reality is breaking into this sin-sick world. The reality of God's kingdom, perfect justice and peace. A kingdom in which there is no fear, no disease, no death, but life in abundance for eternity. In his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul reminds us that as disciples of Jesus, we are called to live as children of light. We are called to imitate the one who is the light of the world. We are called to do what Jesus did by shining forth in our lives the love and compassion of God, even and especially in this time of coronavirus. So what does that look like? Well, the first thing we can do is be present. Be present. Now that may sound kind of odd, after all, aren't we supposed to be practicing social and physical distancing? How can we be present to and for each other if we're not actually physically present with each other? Well, that's where technology is our friend. Yes, it's not the same. But we can be present by calling someone on the phone. We can be present by FaceTime a friend. We can be present by texting, a check-in. We can be present by holding meetings via conference calls, Skype, or Zoom. And we can then offer the gift of our full attention, really listen to the other person, to his or her needs, concerns, hopes, fears, and dreams. I encourage us all to use technology to be present to each other. The next thing we can do to make our way through this challenging time is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. Be honest about what you think and how you really feel. Name it. Speak it. Share it. Pray it. And know that it's okay to go through times of feeling frustrated and discouraged. Even Jesus felt that way at times. And following the model of the souls, which give us permission to voice all of our feelings, he wasn't shy about expressing it. We can do the same, trusting that God accepts and embraces us, and that our brothers and sisters in Christ will do the same. Another important thing we can do is withdraw. Withdraw, take time out. Jesus withdrew all the time. We're repeatedly told in the Gospels that Jesus would withdraw from the crowds and from his disciples and go to a deserted place. This speaks to the fact that there are limits. Even Jesus had limits to what he could do. That's why at the end of any given day, there was still plenty of hungry and sick people whose needs were not met. It's not that Jesus didn't care. He did. But he also understood his limits. And he knew how much he needed time out to rest and rejuvenate. Friends, we may be in for a long and difficult journey, 
with this pandemic. It is therefore imperative that we follow Jesus' example of withdrawing, taking time out. So if you're using technology to be present, give yourself permission to turn off the smartphone. Take a break, watch a movie, listen to music, go for a walk on a beautiful day, take a nap, play with your pets, bake bread or make a healthy meal. Do things that renew your soul and nourish your body. Above all, we can follow Jesus' example of withdrawing from the tyranny of the urgent to make time to keep company with God. Making time for prayer was the way Jesus found the strength and the courage to meet the challenges of his day. So if you haven't already, find a spiritual practice that works for you. Make that practice a daily priority, just like Jesus did. You just may discover along the way that your spiritual practice carries you when you find it difficult to carry yourself. And finally, we do well to remember that we are never alone. As Psalm 23 reminds us, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have no reason to fear. For God is with us in all things, and God will see us through all things. For God loves this world so much that when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, he sent his only son, Jesus. Jesus came to rescue and redeem. He came to share our human nature, living and dying as one of us. He came to defeat the power of death. He came to give us abundant life. This same Jesus is still among us, comforting and challenging, banishing darkness with light, overcoming despair with hope. He will be with us always, and he will give us the strength and the courage we need to press ahead with faith, hope, and love. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Morris, our own bishop, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Don, our president, John, our governor, Sharon, our mayor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who live and work in this community, especially law enforcement officers, firemen and first responders, doctors, nurses, and all medical professionals, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, 
that the world may be free from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present, and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Celeste, Louise, Richard, Carol, Lynn, Tom, and Banky, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, pray this day for the repose of the soul of Bob Marks, father of Chris Jackson, father-in-law of Steve Jackson, and grandfather of Evan and Austin Jackson, and also for the repose of the soul of Ashley Barnhill, sister of Debbie Copeland, sister-in-law of Buff Copeland, aunt of Debbie and Tyler DeFrancis and Brad Copeland, and great-aunt of Ani DeFrancis and Meredith Copeland, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Luke, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. Assist us mercifully, O Lord, in these our supplications and prayers, and dispose the way of your servants toward the attainment of everlasting salvation, that among all the changes and chances of this mortal life, they may ever be defended by your gracious and ready help, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.